business development and research. He is a leadership and career coach, certified human resource management professional, certified ex executive leadership development and emotional intelligence expert, and also a member of the Chartered Institute of Professional Personnel Management, CIPM, Nigeria. So, Dr. Chidike Namani, you have our attention now. Thank you very much, Princess, and thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome once more to class. Um, okay, just to be sure that everyone can hear me, kindly say yes in the chat room if you can hear me. Just type yes. Okay, thank you, Kingsley. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Anna, and all that. Thank you very much. All right. Um, I also like to be sure that you can see my slides. If you can see my slide, please also say yes in the chat room. Okay. Thank you, everyone. All right. So we're just going to go straight to it. I have two hours to deliver my lectures and i trust that at the end of the lecture we all are going to have um, an understanding of what human resource management is all about um now this is introdu introduction to human resource management um like we say this is still general management class um, like it, it, it was announced in the morning, what we're basically doing this weekend is introdu introduction to our different courses. And from next um, week, next weekend, we're going to have different classes running concurrently. And that is where people are then expected to specialize in areas where they, are, they have interest in. But basically, human resource management it's a very important aspect of business. If you are going to be, or if you're already in, in a position of leadership, if you are a team lead in any capacity, if you are managing people in any capacity, then human resource management training, at least the basics is for you. Um, um, I understand that um, in MBA, human resource management is one of the areas of spe specialization is actually because they understand how important it is for people to, or for leaders, or for business managers, for business owners, to be able to manage human resources, to de deliver um, results and strategies. Like I usually say, no matter how beautiful your strategies are, no matter how beautiful your business objectives are, you, no matter how beautiful your vision and mission statements are, if you don't have the right kind of people to deliver, it is as good as nothing. So that is why it is very, very important that even if you're not going to specialize in human resource management, it will be important that you pay attention to this course, especially if you own a business, if you're a team lead, if you're managing people in any capacity. If you are a project manager or if your interest is in project management, of course, in project management, human resources is one of the major areas of management. So it's also it's very important to you. So it is very, very important that we pay attention and after this um, basic um, class, we will then decide if it is an area we would like to continue in or not. And please, for those of you that are already certified human resource professionals, maybe you have a degree in human resource management, you have a master's um, in human resource management, please understand that this is just the basics so please, you will bear with us while we try to introduce people that have never taken um, 
any form of course in human resource management to understand what human resource management is about. Okay, now before I go to my slides, I would like to start this way. What readily comes to your mind when you hear human resource management? I would like us to respond in the chat room. And please, um, like a princess rightly said, there will be question and answer um, session. So please, if you have a question and you need to type it in the chat room, you can go ahead and do that and we can pick it up from there. Otherwise, wait till the Q&A session and you will indicate and your mic will be unmuted and you um, ask your questions. So basically, what really comes to mind when you hear human resource management? All right, Kingsley Dodge says, human resource is using the available resources, human or non-human to achieve the aim. Okay. Um, okay, someone is saying, we can't hear what he's saying. I think, um, Ebuka Uzoma, you need to check your network setting and your device, because I'm sure other people can hear me. Okay, Onakoya said human resources are the people in charge when it, when it comes to job application in any company. Okay, that's right. Please, I need like two more. I need like two more. Okay, um, Abubakar Haman said proper ut utilization of resources in the organization. Okay, that's also correct to an extent. Okay, finally, I'm going to take Ike Chuku. Okay, Ike Chuku says, effective manner of human to achieving set goals. Okay, Hannah said, human resources are defined as the people employed by a company or the department in a company in charge of hiring, training, benefits, and record. Thank you very much. So I'm going to go to what I have in my slide. But like I said earlier, human resource management is actually a very important um, business strategy. And like I mentioned earlier, no matter how important or no matter how beautiful your strategies are without human beings, you won't be able to achieve, accomplish them. I also usually tell people, for those of us that are in customer experience consulting, there's some we call employee experience. Basically, we say that no matter how beautiful yeah, you want to treat your customers, or no matter how beautiful your customer experience strategies are, if your employees are not well mag maximized, if you have employees that are disconnected, it, it has a way it transits to the quality of services that it deliver. So it is very, very important that we pay attention to this, even as business owners, even as team leads. Okay, let me go straight um, to the slides. Basically, what we're going to be doing here today, I will be explaining human resource management. I will be defining human resource management. I will be, look, we'll be looking at the scope of human resource management. We'll be describing the process of human resource management, explain the skills of human uh, HR professionals, explain role of HRM in appraisal management, explain the hiring strategies followed by organization, describe the various retention strategies, explain how HRM manages uh, employee performance, um, look at global human resource, and then seats for effective management. And like I said, I have just two hours and my time is already running. So let's go to what we have here. Okay, yeah, like some of you said, when I ask what's readily come to mind when you think about human resource management, you know, um, the people will send our resume when we see job opening that interest us. The people that make us offer and discuss our pay packages with us. The people that are in doctors in the organization when we are um, newly employed, um, the people you con we contact doubts regarding our pay packages, uh, benefits, um, and all that. So yeah, very very important. 
He said uh, there are also the people that help us during the final exit formalities when we're leaving an organization. And there are also people who also take care of our training and development needs. Now, this is when you just look at human resource as a department. But remember, in this class, we're not just looking at human resource as a department. Like we have identified, some of us may not let Dr. Chidi King. Dr. Chidi King. Okay, we've lost audio. Dr. Chidi King is going to be back soon. He's probably having a network challenge at his end. So please hold on for a bit. Thank you for your patience. Dr. Namani will be here shortly. He's still trying. Hello, princess. Please, where is Mr. Chidike? Mr. Chidike is having a um, network challenge. I'm sure he's going to be back shortly. He's trying to fix up the network connection at his end.
in a moment. All right, everyone. Um, I sincerely apologize for that interruption. I had um, a technical issue, but I'm back now and I I won't go up again. Sorry about that interruption. And please, I just want to be sure that everyone can hear me. Please, can you say yes in the chat room if you can hear me, please, before I continue my class? All right. Thank you very much and thank you for your patience. Okay. Thank you, everyone. So I'm going to proceed from this slide. So basically, um, like I read out, our, and like some of us mentioned, what really comes to our mind when we think about human um, resource management. But like I was saying before I went off um, network, that it is beyond that department that has a set of activities of um, do's and don'ts that employees must follow. It is about being able to maximize the potentials of people in your business, people in your organization, your team, the people under your leadership or your team members to be able to achieve results. So that is what um, human resources management is basically about. And we're going to find out more as we go through the slide. So um, you said you must have guessed correctly that for those of you that um, talked about uh, the departments and mentioned the activities, human resource managers are uh, and people from the HR department, they take care of you right from time when you're employed to a company, when you got a job and all that. They deal with you in your entire lifestyle of involvement with the company. They always stand by you and support you during your tenure with the company. HR managers are also known as people managers, people enablers, and the practice as human resource or people management. Now let's define human resource management. He said it encompasses the management of people in organization from a macro perspective. That is managing people in the form of a collective relationship between management and employees. So here it's looking at managing people from the macro perspective. It's looking at managing um, people in the, in the form of a collective relationship between management and employees, being able to maximize people and use their potentials to achieve the management objectives and goals. That is what um, human resource management is about. He said the HR function is concerned with the notion of people enabling, people development, and they focus on making the employment relationship fulfilling for both the management and employees. Now let us learn about human resource management. So take note, he said, the focus is making the employee, employment relationship fulfilling, very important for both the management and employees. So it is not about the administrative activities. It's not about the, the, the set of, of do's and don'ts. So it is at the end of the day, using people to, um, to maximizing people's potential to be able to achieve the management objective while also keeping in view the people. So at the end of the day, both the management and the people are fulfilled. So that is what real human resource management is about. Okay, still explaining human resource management. He said it's all about people in organization. So it is all about people. I have found out that no matter how the, the workplace or the business or the business world is disrupted by technology, we are always going to be needing people. The only thing, the thing, what, what, the only thing that can change is the kind of skill sets that are required but human beings are always going to be relevant. It doesn't matter how beautiful those technology is. 
if things are still at the center of it all. As a matter of fact, it's human beings that developed those technologies. So it is very important. So he said, human resource management is all about people in organizations. He said, no wonder that some multinationals call them HR managers, call the HR managers, people managers, people enablers, and the practice as people management. And he said, in the 21st century, the HR manager or the people manager is no longer seen as someone who takes care of the activities described in the traditional way. You know, I mentioned it earlier. So it is now, it is beyond, just in case you're here and you in tend to continue with human resource management of the day. Understand that it is no longer a set of activities as described in the traditional way. And I said that most organizations have different departments now dealing with staffing, payroll and, and retention. So instead, the HR manager is now responsible for managing employee expectations. Very, very important expectations because when um, employees get employed, when you uh, uh, apply for a job, for instance, you have expectations. While you, you are looking to meeting that organization's expectations, you also have expectations. You have things that you want to do, you, 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 you also want to be fulfilled. You want to be able to apply your potentials. So it is beyond a set of um, uh, activities, the staffing, the payroll, and all that. So he said the management objective and reconcile. Okay, he said vis-a-vis -vis the management objective and reconciling both to ensure employee fulfillment and realization of management objectives. So it is very, very important that we keep this in view. And whether you're going to be, um, become a HR manager, you're already a HR manager, or you, you work in HR department. It is also important that if from the perspective of a leader, from the perspective of a team lead, from the perspective of a manager, you understand that at the end of the day, what your role is, is to be able to maximize potentials, right? To achieve, to realize management ob objective while the people are also fulfilled. I think that is one area that um, a lot of uh, managers or a lot of leaders don't look at. Oftentimes we focus more on what we want to achieve and we don't really care about that other person. And we forget, like I said earlier, if your employees are happy, definitely it, is, it will be easier to satisfy your customers. So it is very, very important that we begin to look at human resource management from this perspective. It is not just about the do's and don'ts. You must resume work so, so time. You must adhere to this dress code. You know, you must do this. You must do that. No, it is also about the people. How fulfilled are they? How um, are they able to accomplish the organizational objectives using their potentials? Okay, now we, we have here two um, different um, categories of definitions for human resource management. We have the traditional definition and we have the contemporary. So let's look at each of them. Okay, now the first one, which is traditional definition is basically talking about managing people in organization in a structured manner. Take notes in a structured manner. So it is about the activities. It is about a set rules and regulation. It's about the company's policies and procedures, right? It is about the processes of the organization. So you're just managing people in a structured and thorough manner. So that is the traditional um, definition. This covers the, the staffing, that's hiring people, retention, payment, um, my, uh, payment, uh, and fact setting and management, performance management, and all that. So this is traditional definition. So now let's look at the contemporary definition. He said that this encompasses the management of people in organization from a macro perspective. Very important, macro perspective, holistically. He said it means managing people in the form of a collective relationship between management and employees. This approach, approach focuses on the objectives and the outcomes of the HRM function. This cannot be overemphasized. The focus is in 
ensuring that people are fulfilled while the management objective is, uh, objectives are also achieved. So it said that the HR function, that's the contem in, in, in contemporary organization, is concerned with the notion of people enabling, that's empowering people, helping people become all they can become. It is not about their, just their jobs. It is also making sure that they are happy, making sure that they are fulfilled. It's a people development and a focus on making the employment relations fulfill, fulfilling for both the management and employees. So some of us may have had um, maybe personal experiences or you know people that left organizations where it looks like everything was working in terms of their pay packages, the allowances and all that. And they left. And when you probe, or sometimes when people leave organizations and they fill in the exit form, sometimes if you look at it, you can actually, you can actually give you, you, you can actually get a view of the reason why people leave organizations. Sometimes it's just because they are not fulfilled. Sometimes it's just because it's about the pays, it's about the activities, it's about doing their jobs and delivering to the client. So it is very, very important that in human resource management, whether you're working in the HR department or you're a team lead or you have, um, you're in any uh, form of leadership uh, position, it is very, very important that you pay attention to people's fulfillment. All right. So let's look at the importance of HR for organizational success. Okay, now it says the following are the various reasons that organizations need to give importance to human resource management. The evolving business paradigm, the strategic management and HRM, RM, the need for adopting a holistic approach. So we're going to just take um, each item in detail. It's a, one of the factors behind organizations giving a lot of attention to their people is the nature of the firms in the current business environment. There has been a steady movement towards an economy based on services. Very important, economy based on services. If we do we take a, a survey here, I won't be surprised that like 70% of the people in this class work in service-oriented organization as against just um, manufacturing or industrial organization. Indust in um, okay, let's say manufacturing um, organization. So because of that, because for that fact that the current, um, the, because of the way the current business environment is, you have a lot of people going into providing educational services, consulting services, human resource servicing, banking, and other financial services, and all that. He said there has been a steady move towards an economy based on service. Hence, it becomes important for firms engaged in the services sector to keep their employees motivated and productive. So human beings become your competitive strategy. And he said that even in the manufacturing and the traditional sectors, the need to remain competitive has meant that firms in these sectors deploy strategies that make effective use of their resources. This change, changed business landscape resulted due to a paradigm shift in the way business and firms view their employees as more than just resources and instead, and instead adopt a people-first approach. So because of this paradigm shift, because of this fact that we now have more of service economy. People have become a, a major um, strat, um, strategy for business success. So it's no longer about where you just have people that have a, a lot of energies, work in the factory, produce stuff and all that. So you, you need to pay attention to the people if you're running a consulting firm, you need to know that for you to have staff members that are top, a top notch, employees that are able to deliver, you need to pay attention to their fulfillment. You need to pay attention to their satisfaction. So that is one of the major reasons why um, HRM is important for organizational success. Then the strategic management and HRM, you say there's a need to align organizational goals 
with that of the HR strategy to ensure that there's a, an alignment of the people policies with that of the management objectives. So HRM does not uh, run in isolation. So at the end of the day, there's a business strategy. At the end of the day, um, the organizations have goals and objectives. They have mission statements. They have visions. And at the end of the day, this HRM is very, very strategic in accomplishing those goals. So that is one of the reasons or importance of HRM for organizational success. Now, the last one, he said, need for adopting a holistic approach. So the practice of HR must be applied to the overall strategic goals for the organization instead of a standalone thing that makes unit that, that takes a unit base or a micro approach. So now it is that is why um, in one of the slides that um, we looked at earlier, you said that some organizations have decided to have organization uh, to have units that that take care of those activities like uh, payrolls and all those kind of activities so that the HR person will, will focus on the strategic objective of the organization. So he said that the idea here is to adopt a holistic uh, perspective towards HRM that ensures that there are no piecemeal strategies and the HRM policies enmeshes itself fully with those of the organizational goals. So it is important that it's not just one small unit that runs in organizations and just performs administrative rules. Otherwise, the accounting and the admin, uh, admin department will be able to handle those roles. So the, the whole idea is that the H human resource management try to focus on the strategies, try to um, stand as a mediator between the uh, employees and the management. And at the end of the day, is to be able to ensure that the employees are fulfilled and the management objectives are also accomplished. Okay, now we're going to look at the scope of human resource management. Like I said earlier, this is an introductory class. So that is why we're taking our time to um, look at all this so that we can all be on the same page. So the, the objective of the HRM spans right from the manpower needs assessment to management and retention of the same. To fulfill this purpose, human resource management is responsible for effective designing and implementation of various policies, procedures, and orders. So let's go um, and look at the scope. However, it mentions that the scope of HRM is widening with every passing day, considering the intricacies involved. Right, uh, right, like uh, Mr. Banito mentioned in, 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 the, in, the, in the first class we had today, because the business world is evolving and uh, knowledge is also progressive. So, so it is to the body of knowledge like human resource management, it is widening with every passing day. So that is why it has gone beyond the traditional way where all the uh, uh, all we, we knew about human resource management was just uh, a set of activities, a set of administrative activities, where it has become a strategic function in an organization. So let's look at the different um, the scope of human resource management. So it said that the scope covers, but is not limited to the following functions, training and development. That is one of the areas, of course, to be able to help people maximize their potentials. You need to train them and develop them constantly. Then another area is grievance handling. We are required as leaders, as team leads, as HR uh, executives or managers to be able to handle grievances, to be able to handle conflicts effectively. So that is one of the areas. So if you're looking at getting certified in human resource management, if you're looking at managing people or, or you're already managing people, these are the areas, these are the scope. The other one is HR planning. The other one is rewards and recognitions. We have legal procedures, payroll management, 
hiring, recruitment, and selection, and then industrial relations. Now, even though the scope is extensive and far reaching, we want to uh, classify them under three major categories so that even if you don't remember the other slide where um, um, we mentioned the different scopes, if you can remember these three areas, HRM in personnel management, these are the three major cat categories, HRM in employee welfare and HRM in industrial relations. So these are the three broad areas of human resource management, personnel management that has been able to manage the resources, the em uh, employee welfare, being able to cater for employee welfare and also industrial relations. So we're going to explain them in detail. Now, HRM in personnel management is typically direct manpower management that involves manpower planning, hiring, that's recruitment and selection, training and development, induction and orientation, transfer, promotion, employee productivity, compensation layoff, and retrenchment. So this is the, what this area handles, the personnel management. So say that the overall um, objective of this area is to ascertain individual growth development and effectiveness, which indirectly contribute to the organizational development. Of course, at the end of the day, it's about the organizational development, but it is the individuals in an organization that determines how successful an organization becomes. So that is why it is very important that you pay attention to them. Or that, that is why it's very important that as a manager, as a leader, you pay attention to them. Then the other one is HRM in employee welfare. This is a particular aspect of HRM that deals with the working conditions and amenities at workplace. This includes a wide array of responsibilities and services, such as safety services, health services, welfare funds, social security, and medical services. So this aspect or this area is focusing on the working condition and amenities and the general welfare of the employee. The, main, the mistake that some organizations make or some of us make as leaders is that we just focus on what we want the employees to do. And we forgot that without a good environment, without a, a conducive environment, without producing them, providing them with what the tools that they need, they may struggle. And at the end of the day, it will affect the bottom line. So this is a very important aspect, employee welfare. That is an area of human resource management. You need to go just beyond giving people a set of things to do to be able to take care of their welfare. Okay, so it extends to supervision, employee counseling, right? Very, very important. Because oftentimes we have managers, we have leaders, we have um, HR personnel that just focuses on what they want the employees to do. And you no, know, like uh, the, uh, the, the, the lecturer that talked about emotional intelligence, you see uh, staff members going through struggles, going through issues, and sometimes we don't even pay attention to that. We don't even take time to find out, okay, you used to be like this, you used to perform. All of a sudden, you're de demotivated. What exactly is going on? So it is an aspect of human resource management, the counseling part, where you sit down and you're able to find out what people are going through. Because at the end of the day, you want to achieve results. And you want people that are whole. You want people that are happy. You want people that are motivated. You want people that look forward to going to work, to be able to achieve those business objectives. So it is important that we understand that when you take time to pay attention to employees, when you pay attention to, 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 to people under your supervision, it doesn't, it's, it, it's not a waste of your time. When you have one-on-one -on -one sessions, 
try to cancel, try to mentor people in the organization as a leader, it is not um, a, a, a waste of your time. It is very, very important and is a, a very important aspect of human resource management. Okay, now the final one we have here under the broad scope is the HRM in industrial relations. And he said that this is a highly sensitive area and it needs careful interaction with labor or employee unions addressing their grievances and setting the disputes effectively in order to maintain peace and harmony in the organization. I don't know how many of us have experienced um, like um, labor union picketing or protesting as, as the case may be. This is one of the areas because at the end of the day, as an organization, you exist in a society. So you don't just, that is why um, organizations have um, social responsibilities. You have stakeholders beyond even your employees, like the labor unions and who are part of your stakeholders. And you should ensure that they are properly managed. Otherwise, it can cause a distraction and it, or it can affect the level of productivity. Because if you have employees that are not satisfied, and if for any reason they report to the organization to the labor union or the employee union, as, as the case may be, it may result to the employee union coming to shut down your organization or picketing or doing something that may distract your business for a while. So that is why it's very, very important that you pay attention to that. Just like when you exist in a, in a community, you're expected to pay attention to your host community, you're expected to pay attention to your stakeholders. You don't just say, I am here and all I care is about my business, my productions and all that. So very, very important. So those are the three broad areas. So let's proceed now. Okay, now we said another vital part of the HR planning process is succession planning. He said it refers to the way in which a company forms policies for replacing key members of its, its organizations, shifting transfer of authority and responsibility carefully from a living member to a new member. Now, for those of us that are going to stay with us to the, um, that, uh, for those of us that are going to indicate interest to continue with human resource management, of course, we're going to take all these areas in details. We're just basically introducing them. So we're going to have classes where we're going to be looking at things like succession planning, because it's actually one of the major areas that I have observed um, personally, where you have leaders that tend to make this mistake where they have the, the rock stars in their organizations or the superstars those that they think that they are, comp that they are um, very competent. And we, some oftentimes leaders make the mistake of just focusing on those ones. And you find out that when these people leave the organization, you find out that you don't have any other person that can step into their shoes just because, yes, of course, as a manager, as a leader, most of the times, what you want to do is to be able to to deliver results, but understand that you need to also focus on other individuals in that organization. You don't just focus on one person. You don't just make one person a rock star and just, you know, you, you take time to make sure that other people are groomed, other people are mentored, other people are trained. So you don't have instances where someone wakes up and decides to leave an organization and the organization starts struggling or maybe you as a business owner, something that you were um, maybe, or some operations, operational activities that you have moved on from and you're focusing on strategy and business development, you find yourself coming back to start doing those things because there was no succession planning. So it is very, very important. And like I said, it's one of the areas that we're going to take time to deal with. Okay, just a simple question. And um, if you know the answer, just type in the chat room. Say which of the following is not a scope of HRM? Which of the following is not a scope of HRM? So please type in the chat room if you know the answer. Okay. Eddie Young says quality management. Okay. Things we said quality management. <laughs> I need more. Otobong said quality management QM. Okay. 
Okay, let's find out. All right. You all are very correct. Quality management is not a scope of human resource management. Thank you very much for paying attention. Let me repeat, please, if you have questions, if you think you're going to forget them before the class, you can leave them in the chat room. I, I trust that Princess is going to take note of them and we're going to handle them during the QA, QA session. Thank you very much. Okay, now let's look at processes in human resource management. You say each organization works, works towards the realization of one vision. The same is achieved by formulation of certain strategies and ex execution of the same, which is done by the HR, HR department. The reason why it is important that we pay attention to these things is that even if you decide to become a human resource manager or you start to, to, to tow that path, to, to that, to that career path, you might have situations where you go into an organization and even when they have templates already, they will expect you. Like we said, knowledge is evolving. Things change every day. Like uh, during this COVID era, a lot of things were disrupted, right? You will have a lot of people, you know, the working from home <laughs> became a buzzword. You know, you call people and everyone said, I'm, says, I'm working from home. So the approach to human resource management has changed. It is no longer the same way that we used to manage people where you, you, you see them physically every day. Now you have situations where organizations, some organizations have shared those where you have um, some people come in on different days. You have where, you know, organizations like Google, I think, and Co. have said that their staff can continue to work from home till 2021. So automatically, the HRM person or the managers, you now need to evolve. You now need to be able to go beyond your regular physical people management to be able to adopt ways where you can collaborate using technology, where you can, you know, you have um, different softwares. Or, or, or different apps that you can use. So it is very, very important that we need to be very creative. Of course, we're going to look at it. That's one of the skills that the HR person must have. But I was just saying that it's important to pay attention to these processes. Because even if you go, you can have a new organization looking for a HR person. Or you have some organization, though it is not best practice, but you have some organizations where both uh, human resource management is lumped under uh, admin and sometimes under accounting. And you are required to be able to understand these processes. And sometimes you are required to start creating templates from the scratch. So it's very, very important that we pay attention to this. Okay, I've used up almost one hour. So I'll try to see how fast I can get while I try to also explain the concepts. Okay, so the following are the various HR processes Human resource uh, planning, recruitment, selection, hiring, training, um, employee remuneration and benefits administration, performance management, employee relations. Okay, so we're going to take you one after the other. So for human resource planning, it is also an area that we're going to focus on for those that are going to continue with this course. Human resource planning is a course on its own. So, but like I said, we're laying foundation. So it encompasses recruitment, selection, hiring, training, induction, orientation, evaluation, promotion, and layoff. It's generally considered as a process of people forecasting. That's planning. Okay, so the human resource plan involves the following functions. Recruitment, that's attracting applicants that match a certain job criteria. Selection, of course, after you have attracted them, you have um, sent out adverts and all that. The process of shortlisting and selection and all that is one of the processes that is required. And that's one of the skills that you need to have. Even if you're not in human resource management, some organizations get team lead, leaders involved, even in appraisal process and all that. So we're going to get to that. So selection, hiring, that is where you decide upon the final candidate to get, to get the job, training and development. So yeah, it is, it, 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 it is a process 
where you are able to analyze the training needs of individuals in an organization and be able to recommend trainings and also make sure that they are trained. So that's the first one. The, the second one is employee remuneration and benefits administration. You say the process, this process involves deciding upon salaries and wages, incentives, print benefits, and political side bonuses. Of course, um, in some organizations, it is left solely for the uh, C-suite executives, the CFOs, the CCOs, the COOs, the CEOs, and all that. But in some other organizations, that is the way it should be. The managers or the human resource people are also involved in the, pro in the process. So it is very, very important that we get conversation with them. And like I said, we're also going to emphasize on them in subsequent classes. Performance management, that's another area. This is one of the, it helps the, it helps the organization to train, motivate, and reward workers. It is meant to ensure that the organization goes and met with efficiency. Um, and one um, component of performance management is appraisal. I'm going to uh, discuss appraisal in this class. And said nowadays there's an automated performance management system. Of course, we know that the world has evolved. I just mentioned it. The, the, the whole workplace has been disrupted by technology. And uh, I think COVID-19 has made it more glaring. So um, nowadays, the automated performance management systems, and sometimes all you need is just Google, and you find out the different performance management systems that you can use and can customize to suit the objectives of your organization. Now, employer, uh, employee relations, um, I've talked about it earlier. Um, he said, this include labor law and relations, work environments, employee health and safety, employee conflict management, employee, employer conflict management. Of course, <laughs> that, that's one area. Like I mentioned, um, a HR person is like a mediator. Sometimes even an employer may have an issue with an employee and uh, he or she is relying on the, the HR person to advise. So it's one of the processes that you need to be acquainted with. Okay, so another question, just to be sure that we're following. Which of the following is an aspect of HRM which deals with working conditions and amenities at workplace? So please provide your answers in the chat room. I trust that it is simple, but let me just be sure. Please, I'm waiting for your answers. Okay, Abai Omi, Employee Welfare, Kingsley, Employee Welfare, Nelson. Okay, thank you very much. So let's find out if we're correct. Yeah, Employee Welfare. All right. Okay, now let's look at the various keys of HR professionals the various skills that you must have as a HR professional. And I just like to emphasize that if, um, in my own words, I would say as people manager, people enabler, uh, business owners and all that. So these are the skills that you must have. HR skills, decision making skills, technical skills, leadership skills. So HR skills, you are required to know how people play a role in the organization, an advantage against the competition as well as the policy programs, ETC. So it said that the today's HR professional must be skilled at communicating, negotiating, and team development. Very important. The art of leadership is communication or the heart of leadership. So very, very important that we understand that so that's one of the skills that you must have like we have defined it's not about you may know those um those uh, administrative skills you know you know you know how to use your computer very well to prepare documents and all that but it is beyond documents it is about people management it is about interpersonal relationship so it is very very important that you learn how to communicate you know the right word to use per time is very, very important. So HR skills, so very, very important. Your communication, your team development, 
your negotiation skills need to be. That's one of the skills that you need as a HR professional. The other one is decision making. Now we have agreed that the contemporary human resource management has moved beyond a set of rules and regulations or activities or administrative activities. Now it is now strategic. So it, it means that you are involved in decision making at different levels, whether it is about an employee's uh, remuneration, an employee's uh, appraisal uh, uh, outcomes and all that. So it is very, very important that you are you acquire the decision making skills. We're also going to to buttress them in um, subsequent classes. He said HR manager should take a variety of decisions that affect whether employees are qualified and motivated and whether an organization is protein, operating efficiently and um, complying with the law. So it is also, it's also your place, or uh, HR manager or a people manager to advise on whether an organization is complying with the law, with the employee relation with labor laws. Sometimes the CEOs, the COOs, the CTOs, and the, all the C executives may not know this, but because this is your role, it is important that you have that skill. So you should be able to acquire the decision-making skills. Of course, the technical skills, which is part of the reason why most of us are here. This is talking about um, the professional competency that is required of you. He said, in HR, professional need knowledge of state-of-the-art practice in such areas as staffing, development, reward, organization, design, and all that. So you are required to update yourself, you know, state-of-the-art practices in different areas. <laughs> the, even the knowledge you're, you're gaining now can change before 6 p.m. today. So it is very, very important that you keep updating yourself. You keep attending trainings like this. You keep attending seminars. You keep doing things that will give you a, a competitive edge. So technical skill. And the final one is the leadership skill. Of course, being able to manage people, human resources. You see, um, HR managers need to play a leadership role with, with regard to the organization's HR. In today's environment, leadership often requires help in the organization manage change. HR professionals oversee the change taking place to make it a, a success. Of course, because when an organization decides to adopt a new strategy, you know, maybe something happens, they adopt a new product line or something, and there's an adoption process, and the HR person is, ex is expected to help in the, in, to manage the change process. The team lead, as the case may be, the, the people manager, as the case may be. So it's very, very important that you have this leadership skill because at the end of the day, you should be able to influence people because leadership is about influence. You can go ahead and have the set of rules and regulations, the process, pro, uh, processes and procedures, the, pol uh, the policies and all that. If you are not able to influence people, and that is actually where uh, the, uh, the previous class we had on emotional intelligence comes into play. Because, um, of course, it is about understanding yourself and understanding other people, your emotion and other people's emotions and being able to manage it effectively to achieve positive results. So as a, a HR person, as a people manager, you need to develop leadership skills. You need to develop leadership skills. You don't want to be that kind of leader that people respect just because you're occupying a position. So you're just a positional leader. So the only reason why your subordinate is greeting you is because <laughs> you might give him query, right? You know, I was listening to, you know, it's funny, the kind of things that, that, that happen in the workplace. I was listening to a radio program, I think two days ago, and somebody was saying that uh, he sent a mail to his boss and his boss responded to him rudely just because he did not add ma to the email. You know, and the guy was... It was an, a, 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 radio, a radio show. I can't remember what the, the host was talking about. 
But the guy had to come and say it on radio because as far as he's concerned, really, he doesn't even think that, that his boss des- deserves the mark. And now it is even an issue. You know, they say being a leader is like being a woman. You don't need to tell anybody that you're a woman. If you, if you have to tell someone that you're a woman, is like that, that, that means there's an issue <laughs> with, with your leadership. So we need to be able to get to that level where we're able to influence people without our position, where people can expect to even after you have left that position. Okay, now imagine, imagine HRM functions as evolving HRM functions, business and strategic partner. I'm sure that if, if, if we look at, at, at adverts these days, they don't say, organizations no longer say HRM, HR managers. Most of the time they say HR strategic partners. So it, it shows that people are beginning to understand that, okay, these people are not just coming to manage ad, ad, ad administrative activities. They are very strategic, strategic in the growth of their organization. They are very strategic in giving the employees the experience that will get them satisfied and which will in turn affect their level of pro- productivity and the overall prof- profitability of the organization. So now you're, they are referred to as strategic partners. So the time manager contributes to the development of the organization, organization Realization of business plans and achievement of, of objectives. Then the other one is change champion. Like I mentioned earlier, you have situations where new policies, new products, or whatever you have is to be implemented. And the employees are expected to adopt them, you know, adopt those strategies, beautiful strategies. But if nothing, if they are not adopted, they will just be there on the shelf and at the end of the day, they won't impact anybody. So the HR person or the people manager is very, very key to ensuring that those changes are adopted. Then the employee advocates, that's the third one. Here, HR manager have to serve as advocate of the employees. It means that they have to create a work environment in which the employees are motivated, contributing and happy, very important. An advocate, you are the one that speak up no, you don't just come to do your job. If you notice something you think needs to be attended to, you don't just wait. Sometimes the, the, the MD or CEO is very busy chasing businesses that he doesn't even understand that these things are going on. Sometimes he thinks that he's really just to get jobs and just you guys deliver. So it is your responsibility to advocate. Let him understand that, okay, if we're going to deliver, this is the kind of environment we need. We need an enabling environment. Okay, now we're going to look at the differences between personnel management and human resource management. I'm sure before now, some of us think that it is the same because of course, especially in the civil service setting, what is very conversant is personnel management. But now we just want to look at the difference. It is also like the difference uh, between the definition of traditional um, traditional definition of human resource management and the contemporary definition. And if you've been paying attention to um, what I've been saying, um, it will be easier for you to just um, come along. Okay, so personnel management was used to refer to the set of activities concerning the workforce, which included staffing, payroll, contractual obligations, and other administrative tasks, very important. Administrative, administrative tech, that's what personnel management. <laughs> and I'm sorry to say if you, I know that a couple of parastatas have changed. Caught see people that, that, that joined them from the public sector. But a typical government parastata, a typical um, civil service um, unit runs personnel management as against human resource management. So it is about they, you know, they prepare the, the payroll, give you your contract and perform other administrative tasks. Okay, but let's look at personnel management. And I said, with the advent of resource-centric organizations in recent decades, it has become imperative to put people first, as well as secure management objective of ma- maximizing the return on investment on the resources. 
this, this has led to the development of the modern HRM function, which is primarily concerned with ensuring the fulfillment of management objectives and at the same time, ensuring that the needs of the resources are taken care of. In this way, HRM differs from personnel management, not only in its broader scope, but also in the way in which its mission is defined. HRM goes beyond the administrative tasks of personal management and encompasses a broad vision of how management will like the resources to contribute to the success of the organization. So very important, it is strategy, it is about how to use human, uh, um, the human resources to impact on the return on investment. So it is no longer a set of activities like it is in or like it was in personnel management even though I know that a lot of organizations, even in the private sector, still operate their human resource management as personnel management. But for us in this class, it's very clear that there's a difference between personnel management and human resource management. Okay. So I have like 40 minutes, so I will try as much as possible to ensure that I cover my class. Okay, so let's look at these com um, concepts in human resource management practices. <laughs> now, I, I'm sure that this is uh, becoming more, te more technical and um, I will need us to pay attention. The first one is job analysis. He said it's a systematic explor exploration study and recording, and recording the responsibilities, duties, skills, accountabilities, work environment and ability requirement of a specific job. So why you need to learn this is that whether you're working as a HR manager or you're working in an organization where you're required to do that, even um, sometimes, even as a team lead as, or as a departmental head, sometimes you're required to do these things and then send it to the human resource management people who will then put them out. So, he said it involved determining the relative importance of the duties, responsibilities, physical and emotional skills for a given job. All these factors identify with a job demand and what an employee must possess to perform a job productively. That is job analysis. Then job description. Of course, that is the one that we're conversant with because a lot of us were used to JD. He said, what is your job description in this organization? When you resume, they give you another. But he said, include basic job related data that is useful. Okay, now, usually it is used to advertise a specific job and attract a pool of talent. It includes information such as job title, job location, reporting to an employee, job summary, nature and objective of job, tasks and duties to be performed, working condition, machines, tools, and equipment to be used by respect prospective worker and hazards involved in it. So this is the one that we usually see when organizations are advertising for jobs. Job specifications. This is a step further. A, a step further. I said it's known as employee specification. It's a written statement of edu educational qualifications, specific qualities, level of experience, physical, emo physical, emotional, technical, communication skills, and all that required to perform a job. It also includes general health, mental health, intelligence, aptitude, memory, judgment, leadership skills, emotional ability, adaptability, flexibility, and all that required for a job. So this is a step for a step for that. Sometimes or, um, organizations include this in job adverts. Some other times it's just something that you need to have um, in house. Then job design. You say the follow job analysis, and the next step after job analysis is aim at or outlining and organizing tasks, duties, and responsibilities into a single unit of work, very important, for the achievement of certain objectives. It also outlines the method and relationships that are essential for the sources of a certain job. Okay, I'm trying to run fast. Okay, so let's look at training and development now. Because as a people manager, as a leader, as a HR professional, Training and development is one of the areas that you must be acquainted with. Because for you to, for, for the organizations to be able to achieve their objectives, we have defined that human beings are at the center of it all. Employer experiences are the center of it all. And for you to be able to maximize their potentials and for them to be able to give in their best 
training and development is one area that must be paid attention to. And let me also say this. It doesn't matter if you're even a one-man business. You don't recruit someone and you expect the person to keep performing, keep evolving without training. You expect the person to do better. You expect the person to be able to um, evolve with global best practices, evolve with the whole uh, disruptions that has, uh, technology has brought. So it's very, very important that whether you work as a human resource manager or you manage people or you own your own business, training and development is a very important aspect. Even if it is a non gov even if it was um, a non-governmental organization or a charity organization, as the case may be, it is very, very important that you keep developing people, you keep helping them to maximize their potential so that they will deliver at the end of the day. They say that training is a plan effort to facilitate the learning of job-related skills, knowledge, and behavior by employees. Is the acquisition of knowledge, skills, and behaviors. Very important. It's not just knowledge. It's not just about skills. It's, it's also about behaviors that improve an employee's ability to meet change in a job requirement. So behaviors, you know, things like... Um, in, uh, emotional intelligence and if if you if you do the whole courses on emotional intelligence it bothers a lot around behaviors like you have a course like anger management you know so at this point when you're not just looking at the skills you're not just looking at the competencies where someone has all the skills and competencies required to deliver on a job but the person is unable to manage people effectively the person is not unable to, 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 to grow, to climb the career ladder. So that is why this behavior um, part is very important. Okay, so the following consideration need to be taken into account when um, you try to assess the training and development needs. You need to ask yourself, is this spontaneous on plan training or systematic plan training? Spontaneous uh, example, COVID-19, all of a sudden, um, the workplace is disrupted and people need to be trained on how to be able to work from home. People need to be trained on how to be able to use basic skills like Zoom, like Microsoft Teams and what have you, like we transfer, you know, you deal in videos and you can no longer go to go and deliver such uh, items to your client physically. So it's an example of us an, uh, an unplanned training. I need to consider that. Then the other thing you need to consider is focus on current job skills or future job skills. Are you trying to train for the employees or for the person or for the individuals to plan for future job skills? For instance, someone has been performing well on his or her job and you need the person to move to become a manager then at that point it's no longer about if the person has the skills maybe the person is an analyst of course he knows his data very well he can write his report very well he can use all the charts and all that but at this point it is just beyond the person focusing on his system and um, writing reports if the person needs to learn leadership at that point you start sending the person to trainings as executive leadership trainings emotional intelligence trainings and what have you so you need to come you need to check, is it on the current job scale? Is it that I need this person to be able to write this report better going forward? Do I need the person to be able to use more of infographics instead of just words? So it's very important. And then train few employees or train all employees. Are you looking at train the trainer kind of training? You want to train the, the head of the department and the person goes, come back and train others. Or is it the kind of training you want to bring in everyone? So in the, then the last one, the individual orientation or group orientation. All right, so we're look, going to look now at the various kinds of training provided to employees, to staff, to subordinates, as the case may be, depending on your position. If you're a business owner, you may even have just one staff. So it's important that I look at the various kinds of training. The first one is induction. Supervisory is the second, technical is the third, 
and management development is the fourth. So induction is where the new recruit is introduced to the organization. Condition of services, rules of behavior, ETC. Okay, that is where the person familiarizes himself or herself with the organization. You know, that is where you introduce the person to the policies and procedures of the organization, the dress code and all that. So this kind of training is basically induction. It is required that this person at this level already has the competencies required because that was why the person was employed in the first place. But of course, you know, the, for the person to be able to perform, the person needs to get used to his or her internal environment. And that is where induction comes in. The person needs to understand uh, the policies and procedures of the organization and all that. So this is induction. The next one is supervisory. Supervisors are trained for technical skills, leadership qualities for handling machines and men. So here it is supervisory. So it's no longer just about the person, person's co technical competencies, which is the next um, type of training, but the person is going into a supervisory role. The, I, I think one of the major mistakes we make, especially in Africa as a whole, is that we just expect people, expect people to learn on the job. Sometimes somebody just from being an, uh, an intern or uh, becoming a trainee and the next the person becomes an associate and all that. And they just assume that, okay, because you can do your job very well, you can become a supervisor. It does not work like that. There are special skills that are re required for supervisors for managers and all that. So at this point, the person is trained to be able to manage people and machines, very important. Then technical training, this type of training that help in inducting new entrants to the operational requirements of the unit and improving the skills of existing employees for promotion. So this is technical now, improving the, that, the skills that they already have or their professional competencies. Then the last one is for managers. You say it's for either existing or future managers. This training program emphasizes attitude and values. That is where your emotional intelligence comes in. That is where executive leadership training and some of this uh, management training that we're doing in IIPM come in. So it is management development. It is not about how to use Excel because the person already can use Excel effectively. It's not about how to prepare PowerPoint slides. It's not, um, um, yeah, all those things are, technical skills that the person already has. But here, the emphasis is now on attitude and values. You know, I like to give this example of a manager in a certain consulting firm. As a matter of fact, um, uh, one of the big, you know, if you're mentioning the top three in, in Nigeria, yeah, but this person lost his job just because of attitude and values. At the point where the person was so confident that he knows what he's doing and um, an appraisal happened and the person was asked to go. So at the management development, of course, for the person that has to have climbed the career ladder and got to the point where he or she is being considered for a management position, it's obvious the person already has the technical competencies. But now the person needs to be trained on how to manage people the person needs to be trained on emotional intelligence. The person needs to be trained on how to supervise people and all that. So it is very important. So induction, supervisory, technical, and management development are the three are the four various kinds of training. Thank you. All right. Now we're going to look at appraisal management. Now. This is important, whether you're a HR, uh, whether you, you work in the HR department or not, whether you own your own business, you don't just bring in people and for you year in, year out, month in, month out, and you don't have any um, process for appraising them. You expect them to grow. You expect them to do better. You expect them to perform better. You know, sometimes you scold them. You've been like this since I know you. But you've not provided a person matrix. You've not been...
been able to measure the person. So sometimes it's like you're early. But if there's a process, there's an appraisal management process, it makes your life easier. I also understand that it's not just the HR people, the, the managers and the team leads are usually um, usually participate in appraisal management. So it is very important. You say it is a process of reviewing an employee's performance during the preceding year or cycle and deciding where he or she stand as far as far as their peers in the same brand band are concerned. Hence, our present manner is all about the process of reviewing results, arriving at a rating, and then deciding upon the bonus or salary hike. So very important, arriving at a rating, there has to be a rating. There has to be like a rating grid or a checklist or something. So very important in appraisal, appraisal process. Okay, so typically the process starts a month or two before the appraisal cycle ends. Um, this is just a model. There's no hard and fast truth. Sometimes it depends on the type of organization. Sometimes it depends on the policies of the organization. Sometimes it depends on the size of the organization. So please note, this is just a model so it is not there's no hard and fast rule yeah so he said the appraisal cycle can be half yearly or yearly depending upon the policies of the organization like i said earlier so it can be quarterly it can be biannually it can be monthly if you like especially if your organization is a, is a small one then note that why a lot of organization does it biannually or annually is because at the end of the day people are expected are expecting a, some form of compensation people are expecting some form of promotion and all that so if you want to do it monthly so be ready to increase people's salaries monthly so i guess that is why um some people do yearly some people do biannually and all that so but it's very very important that you decide what works for your organization and do that so it's um, okay. I have said that. Furthermore, the appraisal cycle can be based on the calendar of the financial year. Yeah, you know, or the financial year. Some people do October. Like my own organization, we do financial year, which is October. That is, it can run from January to December of the same year, or April to March of the following year, as the case may be. Okay, so. Well, we're looking at the different rounds to the appraisal process. And like I said, there's no hard and fast rule. It depends on what works for your organization, depending on the type of organization you run and your structure. In the first round, the people who participate in an employee appraisal are the employee. Okay, I have like 30 minutes. The employee and his manager. In this round, the manager gives a frank assessment of the employee's performance after giving a chance to the employee to self-assess himself. So this is very important, like we do to my organization. You will first of all print the form and you give it to the, the employee to assess himself or herself. And then he, he, he uh, submits to the manager and the manager now gives a frank assessment looking at the different parameters and looking at the different uh, metrics. So depends on what works for you. The second round consists of the rating from the manager and the manager's manager. So this is a uh, situation where maybe there's a group head and all that, depending on the structure of the organization or how big. You know, maybe there's a group, a group manager. So in this process, it's now the manager and the manager's manager. It's mostly about deciding the band in which the employee falls the rating and in comparison with his or her peers the process of rationalizing the employee's performance with all that is called normalization okay so that is the second round the third round is where the hr manager is involved as well in any case the rating cannot be decided without the hr manager assent to the same once these rounds are over the bonus level or the salary hike are decided so the hr manager the departmental head, the team leads are usually involved from the beginning of the appraisal, even when the matrix are, are designed, are decided, you need to look at them. And at the end of the day, 
you know, in some other organizations like mine, who will sit down in the boardroom, and that is where each employee is discussed, you know, at the end of the day. And that is why it's very, very important that if you're an employee in this place, you understand that you're not just answerable to your direct manager, your line manager, as the case may be. Sometimes in the appraisal process, the people that decide if you deserve a promotion or not are not just your direct manager. But the HR managers will say what they will make their own input. Then other managers will make their own input. So sometimes you see your line manager trying to defend you and you're not there, or your sponsor, as the case may be, and you're not there. But because you know you may be delivering on your job but you don't have any good interpersonal skills you just come and you sit down and do your job and you don't relate with other people so the other managers may like be like okay he may be delivering but for this guy to become a supervisor i don't think he or she has good interpersonal skills and that may disqualify you so very important and just a tip okay now i said it has been found that the appraisal management process as it exists in many organizations leaves a lot to be desired in fact Surveys and studies have found that the majority of employees who quit organizations do so because of difference over their rating. Yeah, some people feel that the outcome of the appraisal is way, way lower than what they expected. And some of them will start looking for other jobs. And before you know it, they will quit. In other words, attrition, that's the turnout rate and or the rate um, which uh, employees leave organization is, is in many cases a direct consequence of the way in which the appraisal Managing process is managed. This happens because personal biases and prejudices affect the process. In many cases, if the manager and employee do not see eye to eye on many issues, the appraisal and the rating ratings are the place where this difference of opinion comes out into the open. So it's very important. So, like I said, there's no perfect system anywhere. So these things happen. Um, you have um managers that you know they don't see eye to eye with an employee and they will go and wait for you you know those days we used to joke with it yeah you do something and your manager will say like this is an appraisal issue i will just laugh about it but really some managers really use it so they wait for you and they say appraisal is coming i'm going to deal with you so sometimes there are biases there are prejudices and all that but at the end of the day is a process that must be instituted and um, if you're a team lead, if you're a manager, if you're a HR person, just ensure as much as possible that bias and prejudices are eliminated as much as possible. But just like every other human processes, at the end of the day, you may not have it 100%, but just do your best to ensure that you have done what you are required to do at the end of the day. All right. Okay, this is talking about hiring strategies. Um, I may need to proceed, um, especially for those that are going to um, end up in human resource management certification. It is required that you pay for your course materials and you get these and more. You have a very detailed um, material and everything that you need to become a professional. Okay, now let's look at retention strategies. An employee retention strategy would necessarily include a plan for redressing employee grievances and ways and means to address employee issues. Let's go straight to it. So there are different components that make up the retention strategy. Strategy. The first one is job retention, grievance redresser, mitigating job satisfaction. So job rotation is the practice of moving the employee around different functions of the organization with a clear emphasis on making sure that they operate in domains other than the ones assigned to them initially. So um, I see organizations like financial institutions like bank do that. Today you're a teller, tomorrow you're in marketing, the other day you're customer service. So the idea is that you don't get to a point. First of all, it helps to improve your skills because yeah, even if you are a, a good customer service officer, even though even if you're a good operations person, if you're going to climb the career ladder and get to a level where you start managing an organization, 
you will be required to do business development or you will be required to do marketing so you can't necessarily say that marketing is not my thing i'm not a, a people person <laughs> it's not about being out there every day jumping from one office to the other it's about your strategy you can if you can maximize digital platforms it can be people in your net net network and all that so that is one of the things one of the retention strategies so you don't get to a point where people like we get the money they are, they are they are bored and you know tell her cash and tell her what exactly did they do i'm not saying that it's not an important job but it gets to a point where they're like i want to do something else i know i can be more than this i know i can do better and that's okay go and do marketing go and take the challenge of going to talk to people at the end of the day yeah a lot of people especially based on their temperament do not like that but at the end of the day, I usually tell people that that's one area that you cannot run away from. You, you, no matter how you talk about except if you don't have the vision of owning a business or climbing the corporate ladder such that it becomes a top executive, you start sitting on the c suits As a matter of fact, top organizations like the KPMGs of this world and co, when you become a manager, once you become a manager, you're automatically a business development person. And you're required to bring businesses for the organization and if you don't bring business for the organization it becomes an appraisal issue so it is one area that we cannot run away from so this next one on retention is grievance redresser so it's very important that as managers as human resource managers as as team leads and all that we learn learn how to um address grievances with or conflict we don't just assume that it is a it is minor that minor thing can skyrocket into major and at the end of the day it's going to affect your work because at the end of the day what you want is result like i always say it doesn't matter the management style that you want to employ just at the end of the day deliver results and make sure that the people are also fulfilled and satisfied so you need to pay attention to that So the other one is um, mitigating job dissatisfaction. You know, management theories often emphasize the fact that one of the reasons for low employee morale in organizations is the fact that the employee often feel alienated and cut off from the larger purpose. Yeah. So sometimes it's they are disconnected. The employees are disconnected. All they are they they, they know about either because of the management style or whatever or what have you is that they are their primary job and sometimes they are disconnected and they are dissatisfied so the employee feel that they are employees feel that they are part of an impersonal setup and perceive themselves to be unable to make a difference in the whole unit hence there's a need to involve the employees in the larger picture and provide them with perspective on the bigger picture so that is why you know, we talk about executive buy-in all the time because, of course, we just think it's about the executives. But there's also employee buy-in. Those are beautiful strategies. Those are beautiful uh, policies will be performed or will be achieved by the employee. So there's also employee adoption. There's also employee buy-in. So it is also important that you try as much as possible to mitigate the satisfaction as much as possible. Okay, I think I'm almost done. So I have about 20 minutes. Okay, so what we have here is a managing employee um, performance. And basically, we're looking at motivation against ability. So you have different people under you. You have different people you manage. You have different employee categories. So you can either categorize that, categorize, categorize them as solid performers, misdirected efforts, underutilizers, and deadwood. So, and we have also provided advice on what you can do to help um, different employee categories. So the first one is solid performer. The solid performers have high motivation and they have high ability. And for these people in this category, 
reward good performance, so reward them when they do well, identify development opportunities and help them to improve, provide honest direct feedback. If they've done well, tell them that they have, they have done well. Some people managers are very, very stingy when it comes to appreciating people. You know, you deliver the project, you're the project manager, and your, your CEO or your COO is, has given you all the accolades. And you don't know how to share the accolades. So it's very, very important that for solid performance, you provide them honest and direct feedback and also appreciate them. For misdirected efforts, they have high motivation and low ability. So for this set of people, what you need to do is to coach them, give them feedback on their performance, set goals for them, you know, tell them, set goals for them and help them walk through and achieve the goals. Training an assignment for skill development. So help them um, do better by training and assigning skills um, and uh, for skill development and give them assignment for skill development. Restruct restructured job assignments. Yeah, so maybe that the reason why their efforts are misdirected is because they need to do something else. So you need to consider that. On the utilizers, low motivation and high ability. So these people, they have high ability. They can perform if they are motivated. I'm sure if we look, <laughs> either it could be people in this class, it could be people that we know. You know that this person really has the capacity. It could be that this person just starts, um, started out being a hard performer or solid performer. All of a sudden, the person starts falling into the category of being an underutilizer. As a manager or as a leader, it is not um, just for you to start um, harassing the person or start saying um, negative stuff. Find out. You say this person low motivation and high ability. Give honest and direct feedback. Tell the person, you used to be like this. You used to be one of my trusted and most performing staff. What has happened? I need to have a discussion with you. Used to team building and conflict resolution. It could be that there's something that has happened. There's a conflict that is making the person unhappy. So you need to be sure. Link rewards to performance outcomes. Yes, be able to link rewards to performance outcomes. Because sometimes it's like, you know, like we say <laughs> uh, in Nigeria. Please, if you're not uh, Nigerian, please permit me. Uh, you hear people say, I cannot come and kill myself, or I cannot come and go and die. That kind of stuff. Because the person is like, I put all my efforts, it looks like it's not rewarded. And before you know it, the person will start withdrawing. So as a leader, though it is not a justification, it is not a justification for you to withdraw in case you're in this class and you're in that category. Because of course, what if you keep doing what you're doing, keep being better for yourself, one day it's going to translate either when you start doing your own stuff or you go to a place where you'll be appreciated. But for you as a manager, you need to look into it. And instead of, um, instead of um, using negative words or um, harassing the person in a negative manner, please take these actions and help the person improve. Then dead wood, this one's low motivation and low ability. <laughs> I don't know if there are people like this, but for these people, they do not have the motivation to perform and they don't even have the ability to perform. So it is like they can't even perform. And oftentimes, these kind of people, you find them in organizations, most of the time, they don't follow due recruitment, uh, due recruitment process. Either uh, you know they know someone that knows someone they are related to one person, you know um, uh, the management is trying to help the family and they bring in this kind of people because I would expect that if the person went through the regular um, recruitment process, uh, you won't have this kind of person in your organizations except if the HR and the managers, HR people and the managers don't know what they are doing. So we say for this kind of people, we hold pay increase demote the person, outplacement, firing, specific direct feedback on performance. Let the person know that, okay, you're not performing. That's after you have done other things that you, you need to do. Okay, these are the inputs required for HRM. You need to have this information as well. You need to um, 
have this information, duties and responsibilities of every job in the organization. You need to know for each job, you need to know the duties and responsibilities, and you need to update them as may be required. Skills possessed by each, each employee. It is your duty also to know the skills. Even as a, a people manager, even as, as a team lead, you should be able to say for this employee, I know the skills that he or she possesses and I know areas that he or she needs improve, improvement. The third one is identifying training needs. The other one is future human resource needs of the organization. You know, we talked about resource planning, forecasting and all that. We also talked about um, um, basically planning about um, future resources. So that's one of the things. You don't wait until, um, okay, yeah, succession planning. That's one of the areas. You don't wait until you don't find people that can do the job before you start running health as Then the other one that you need to, information you need to have is current productivity of human resources. I think I am almost done. I'm just going to read these ones out. Job satisfaction and organization objectives. Um, these are job factors that result in successful performance of job by employees. So these are the things that when you want to talk about job satisfaction, you know, it's not just about money. Yeah, some people say that money is a major motivator, but it's not the only motivator. I'm sure we, you can, uh, uh, we can agree with me that we've, there, are, there have been people that work in places where they are well paid and all that, and they still resign their job. In fact, I know one, one, he used to work with one of the telcos, but the guy resigned to take an offer from a smaller organization. And when you ask him, he had his reasons. Some other people rather work in small organizations because of the vision that the vision that they have, they are planning to own their own business. And they know that a smaller organization will give them the opportunity to learn all the business processes. And they would rather take that offer. So when you are made job offer, there are a lot of things that you consider for your job satisfaction or when you make people job offers, there are things that they look at. It's not just about the pay. So you as a manager, you as a HR person, you need to also understand that. So the first one is sense of challenge and worthwhile accomplishment. Yeah, how fulfilled they are. Opportunity for personal growth and development. Yeah, you may be paying them well, but they don't go for trainings. They don't go for conferences. They're not exposed. At the end of the day, they are still, by the time you leave the, the, the person, leave the organization, the person doesn't know what is going on. So it's one of the things that um, defines job satisfaction. Opportunity for taking initiative. Yeah, especially when people get to a certain level, they don't want to be micromanaged anymore. Allow them creativity and innovation. Superior's appreciation for good work. I mentioned earlier, we don't take all the accolades. We try to share them. That's one of the things that make people happy. They just, oh, this is my little contribution made the board members happy so next time they will do more and they will be satisfied that this my little contribution is actually making a whole lot of difference decision making authority yeah sometimes empower them we call them empowerment sometimes as a supervisor you know you have like a floor manager you have like a, a cash i say like i have like a customer service executive sometimes empower them to be able to make decisions without necessarily having to to always refer to you. The other one is opportunity for promotion, yes. Job freedom, yes. Um, opportunity to influence superior's decisions. So sometimes let them, you know, when you have a, dec a decision and you allow them, you know, when we're talking about, we talked about situational leadership when we did the executive leadership training, where at a certain level you allow them to make contributions and give them a sense that, okay, they are influencing the, the decision. It's not just a leader that has planned whatever he or she wants to do and the subordinates are just there to perform from the person's enterprise. So the other one is strong because of the social prestige it gives. They may have another organization that doesn't have social pre prestige, but pays them better, but they would rather stay where <laughs> the brand, you know, the image of the organization. Another one is considerate and helpful boss. Yeah, some people go to work sometimes because of their boss. You know, some someone say that people don't leave organizations. They leave, 
I can't remember the exact word, but basically saying that they leave supervisors, so they leave managers, they leave leaders. So sometimes people leave because they just have organization, a, a leader that they cannot cope with. It may be a beautiful organization that has a wonderful prestige, maybe a big financial organization, a big telco, but the person cannot deal just because of the kind of boss that he or she has. So consistent and helpful boss is one of the things that determines people's um, satisfaction. The other one is friendly colleagues. The other one is opportunity to serve society, you know, where um, the, 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 the corporate social responsibility that organizations do and you allow people opportunity to belong to different groups where beyond doing that job that they do where they earn money, there's also something that helps them impact people directly. And there are people like that. The reason they, they will stay in a place is they want to be able to impact people and their job is not impacting life that they're just any money. So when you provide them that kind of opportunity, they will see job security is one. Then pay allowances and other prerequisites. That's bonuses. All right. Okay. I guess this is the last. Um, um, the last. Um, okay, not the last slide, the last area for this introductory class, and we will go to questions and contributions. Now, this is looking at as an introduction to global, global human resource management. Of course, with the advent of have become global, this has increased the workforce diversity and giving to cultural sensitivities. So this globalization of and its workforce led to develop of global human resource management. Yeah, with the advent of technology, globalization, and what have you. Any organization, you know, these days they will say if if you run an organization, no matter how small, and you don't have an online presence, then you have not started. Because the world is now a global village. And for human resource management, you need to work with that consciousness. We need to, you need to work with an understanding that, especially in multinationals, you can, you know, you can send out a job opening and someone is applying, uh, 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 applying from China, someone is applying from UK, someone is applying for Canada. At the end of the day, the person comes in and you need to be sensitive. You need to uh, observe workforce diversity. Uh, you need to pay attention to workforce diversity and cultural sensitivity. So that is what global human resource management is about. Okay, the preliminary function of global human is that the organization carries out a local appeal in the host country, despite maintaining an international field. There's example, to exemplify any multinational slash international company, to exemplify any multinational slash international company will not like to be called as local. However, the same, the same wants to have a domestic touch for the people in the host country. And therein lays the challenge. So we're not permitted to be local champions. So even if it is a company that has a global brand. It's also expected that, yeah, you're, 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 you're also expected to maintain the global brand, the global um, while maintaining, where we're also can, uh, maintaining local appeal in the host country. We're going to give an example. So the objectives of global human resource as follows, create a local appeal without compromising upon the global identity. I'm sure if we think we know um, organizations like that, um, maybe like KFC and all that is a global brand, but of course, they have to create a local appeal. Then the other one, generating awareness of cross-cultural sensitivity among managers globally and hiring of staff across geographical boundaries. So the other one is training upon cultures and sensitivities of the host, host countries, host country. You know, um, when we took one of the courses or in our executive leadership management that one of our facilitators took was about diversity management. This is where it is interconnected with human resource management, cultural sensitivity, very, very important, being able to manage diversity, being able to understand our people's um, culture. Differ. So these are the areas in global human resource management.
decision making. They are setting the degree of centralization, operating, operating decision making. Compare this to international strategy. The competence are centralized and the rest are decentralized. So decision making is one area. Coordination and then integrating mechanism. I'm trying to um, meet the two hours time. I just have five minutes. So like I said, these materials will be available if you're, especially you're going for certification and you can get a more detailed one and read them. This is just an introductory class. Now let us look and look at an example to understand global human resource management. So I'm sure a lot of us um, are conversant with McDonald's. You say, Burger Giant McDonald's Corp is one of the largest restaurant chains in the world. It has a widespread presence across the globe, including India. McDonald's is well known for its hamburgers made with ground beef, French fries, and milk shakes. However, in markets across the world, McDonald's respects local cultures and has adopted its menu and using experiences to local um preferences so mcdonald has varied its menu to accommodate the tastes and cultural sensi sensibilities of residents in countries around the world in india mcdonald's restaurants have dropped beef and pork from their menu in keeping with the sentiments and religious practices of hindus and muslims very important even if you're running a business you need to pay attention to this that's one area of emotional intelligence as well also the kitchens of McDonald's in India are divided into separate sections for cooking vegetarian and non-vegetarian food. McDonald's has always maintained a strong localization policy while I said I'm maintaining um, national uh, brand image and flavor across the globe. McDonald's has also embraced policy of hiring local talent at various levels to promote localization of its presence the like success of McDonald's is attributed to its ability to cater to local taste without losing its brand. In India, some of its American classes have been introduced in numerous vegetarian sessions, like the make veggie burger and make spicy paneer, as well as chicken offering. All right, so briefly, um, global HR and the staffing policy. Uh, say so the role of staffing is still the same here. That is hiring individual with requisite skills to do a particular job. The challenge here is developing tools to promote a corporate culture that is almost the same everywhere, except that the local sensitivities are taken care of. So, there are different uh, staffing policies in global human resource management. And I think that's the last slide. That I'm going to take Ethno ethnocentric in a trans ethnocentric staffing policy. The key management positions are filled by the parent country individuals. Then the, the other one is polycentric. Here, staffing poly uh, the host country nationals manage subsidiaries, whereas the headquarter positions are held by the parent company nationals. Then the last one is geocentric. In this staffing policy, the, uh, the, pol the best and the most competent individuals hold key positions, irrespective of their nationalities. This is just an introduction of global human resource management. It is a major area that we're going to focus on if you decide to enroll to be, become a certified global human resource uh, management professional. So tip. Geocentric staffing policy seems to be the best when it comes to global HRM. The human resources are deployed productively and it also helps build a strong cultural and informal management network. The flip side is that human resources become a bit expensive when hired on a geocentric basis. Besides, the national immigration policies may limit impl implementation. All right. So this will be my final question. And then we'll go to question and answer and then contributions um, session. In which of the following staffing policies do the host country national manage subsidiaries, whereas the headquarter position are held by the parent company? 
please can you respond this will be your last answer and we'll doctor okay thank you polycentric all right thank you very much everyone this is my time and uh, now it is back to princess for questions and contributions and please if you are in this class and for any reason you have to answer some of the questions or you want to make contributions please feel free it is not um limited to the facilitators thank you very much princess. thank you so very much presentation and the fundamentals of professional human resource management i mentioned at the beginning this class is an interactive one and we welcome questions just as dr just said please feel free to do so uh to enable us identify and address please kindly check and rename your device we have a couple of questions gotten from the chat room and i'll take them uh, from the top to the bottom the first uh question came from jonathan anderson and he said please what is the difference between human resource management and human capital management and how can hrm be translated to hcm Dr. all right Namani, uh, please yes i'm here um jonathan i will advise this is one of the area they are related but there are slight differences so this is one of the areas that we're going to cover in this course so i will advise that um, you wait like i said this is just the an introductory class so when um, we will have um, a class where we're going to discuss that in details and we're going to also look at the differences thank you very much thank you the second question came from Pius Benjamin, and he said, in Nigeria, in Nigeria public service, which band do they use for appraisal process? Sorry, I didn't get that question. Okay, um, Pius Benjamin okay. said, in Nigeria public service, which band do they use for appraisal process? Ban. Did you say ban? That was his question. Okay. Um, well, I'm not sure I understand that, but if um, he's talking about the, um, the, 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 the process for um, civil service, like I mentioned um, in my lecture, there is no hard and fast rule. Personally, I have not worked in the civil service or in a government parastata before now. So, but what we provide you in IIPM is a model. We talked about the different round, the first round, the second round, and the third round. So it depends, like, like I also mentioned, it depends on the type of organization. It depends on the structure of the organization. So for the, 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 the civil service, maybe if there's someone here that works in the personnel management in a government parastatal or in the civil service and all that, the person may help answer the question. But what we have just provided you is um, a model for appraisal process. Thank you. Thank you. We have a hand up. Gloria Chizoba, EKDF. I'm going to unmute you. So you please unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Gloria Chizoba. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, all. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Shidike, for this insightful lessons please how can uh, employee appraisals i mean how can uh, one manage a halo effect in employee appraisal i mean by us how can it be managed in organizations because there is bound to be a, a bias especially when it comes to 
relationship between the supervisors or the superordinates and the subordinates. So how can the halo effect be managed or be eliminated? All right. Thank you very much for that wonderful question. And thank you for participating in the class. OK, like I, I mentioned in one of the, the slides, he said that appraisal management process, as he's exiting many organizations, leaves a lot to be desired. Like, what it means is that, like what you just uh, pointed out, there's still a lot to be desired. But what I would advise, which is what I also do in my uh, own organization, first of all, there should be um, organizations, processes, and procedures documented. Because most times, what happens in organizations when things are not properly documented, you find um, leaders taking decisions out of emotions or based on their level of relationship with employees. But first of all, if the policies and procedures are documented, and uh, that is also part of the reason why you induct people when they come into the organization, you let them understand part of the things that you take them through during, um, the, 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 uh, during the, the induction process is the HR policies and induction processes. Then for, for the manager, that is actually, that's also why you have different rounds. That is also why you have different steps. So the idea is that at the end of the day, somehow these biases, these prejudices can be eliminated. By the time you have the round where the employee, first of all, um, fills the form, discusses it, discusses it with his manager, and his manager takes it to his own manager. That is in in a structure where you have like a group manager and all that, and they discuss it. You find out that in that process, um, in that process, the, the, the man may raise some questions or some concerns and see how the, the, the employee's manager is able to defend it. And after that, you still have another um, process where uh, you, you now have like a board meeting where the CEO, the COO, or the c suit depending on the size of, of the organization, but that is what we do in my own organization, and the HR manager, and then the different managers of different organizations, or of different units, or the different team leads. That was where I talked about the fact that someone's promotion may be dependent on another manager, because from my own experience, usually that is the point where people's um, promotions are decided that is where each staff is because the different metrics are discussed and in the process the the, the, the the employees manager may be queried if the employees manager is trying to defend the the employee or his or her subordinates either because they have a good relationship but it is obvious to the other managers that this employee has not been performing well at that point it will be deliberated on and if the if the manager was biased in his appraisal, it will be detected at that point. And um, at that point, it can be curbed. So basically, it is about structures, it is about processes, it is about policies, it is about procedures. Because the truth is, as long as human beings exist, there will always be biases, there will always be prejudices. But if you put these processes in place, you will have helped eliminate um eliminate them to the best minimum thank you very much i hope um i was able to answer your question i hope i got your name correctly um he asked two questions the first is what is the place of work ethics in employee performance? And the second question is, does work ethics contribute to employee performance? Those are his two questions. Of course. Um, like I keep saying, this is an introductory class, right? Ethics is actually a lecture or a class in human resource management. Because you cannot talk about employee performance without ethics and values. So, yes, it is a, an integral aspect of human resource management. And for those of you that are going to um, end up um, proceeding with us in human resource management, that is going to be handled as a class on its own. 
as a matter of fact, even when you're going to be writing your certification exam, because I also did my own exam with IITM, is one of the major areas where a lot of scenarios are going to be created and are going to ask questions that border on ethics. So it's very, very important. And then in appraisal, yes, like I said, it is not just about the professional competencies. The appraisal form is like a written grid. It has different metrics. It has different areas. Also, sometimes, depending on the person's level, um, you won't use the same appraisal, appraisal matrix uh, for a manager and, the, uh, and um, a trainee. So sometimes, yes, ethics cut, cuts across. So yes, it's an integral part because um, values, behaviors, and what, what have you is all about ethics. So it is an integral part, and it, is, it also comprises the matrix for appraisal. Thank you. OK, we have another one from Fola Shadi Daniels. And she said, in a situation where you have a boss that is not following the organization policies in relation to human resource management, like recruitment, promotion, ETC, what do you do as the human resource manager? All right. Um, well, I'm going to borrow from one of the answers that uh, Mr. Banito gave in his class. The truth is that um, what we do is that we lecture you on global uh, best practices. We tell you what should be. But we understand that there are instances where these things are not the way they should. You have like some one-man businesses where the, the manager or the CEO decides to hire and fire at will without recourse to the HR manager. So what you need to do is to advise. First of all, does that organization have a board? Do you know any member of the board? Can you escalate? And understanding that in these things, you're also required to employ emotional intelligence and also consider your own career path. Not because you want to save your career, but if you get to a level where you advise, you escalate, um, yeah, advice before escalation because you need to sit down and have the communication. Sometimes it's not just a verbal communication. Sometimes it might be an email trying to remind your manager or the CEO or the MD, as the case may be, the, the policies and procedures, the HR policies and procedures. But if it gets to a level where he or she is not listening, I remember in this advice, your approach also is very important. Sometimes, even if if you're going to send an email, the wordings of your mail is important. If you're going to have a verbal conversation, the approach is very, very important. So you get, if you get to a level where it's not working, you try to escalate, it's not working, my advice as last, res last resort is to leave. I know that it is hard because you, uh, you say, is there an, uh, any other job out there and all that? But the truth is that you're looking at your future career, you're looking at um, your profile. You want to be able to go to another organization, another organization wants to hire you, and um, they will be able to look at your profile and they see what you did and all that. So that is as a last resort after you have advised. If you're very, very, uh, it, may, uh, it may sound harsh, but then take all the necessary steps and do your best to resolve it. And if you get to a level where you think, you, there, there, there are two things that people usually do. Either you give in, like they say, if you cannot beat them, you join them. I remember in the last class where we, we had, where someone was talking, I think it was about accounting. And someone in HRM also um, made a contribution in that line. It was, uh, the, the lady was saying something, I don't know if she's in this class, but it was at a point where she was trying to regulate the, uh, the, 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 the expenditures and all that and how, how money is expended and how money is being accounted for. And it became an issue. And the manager started fighting her. She got to a level where she said that she would rather withdraw. So it is either you decide to withdraw, which is not the best advice. But first of all, make efforts. Follow all the procedures. Try to advise using different approaches. Try to escalate if there, is, if there are higher um, authorities. And the truth is that it's like you making up your mind. If I perish, I perish. It might even get to a level where in the process of escalating, it will become an issue. The manager will come back and start fighting you. So you need to be sure 
that this is what you want to do, you need to be sure that you rather choose uh, building profiles for your future over the current job that you have. So you need to look at all those things before you decide on what to do. Thank you very much. Oh, I've been able to attempt your question. Thank you very much. We have a hand up. Agbo team. Okay, Chuku. Okay, you you can unmute yourself. Agbo team. Okay. Agbo team. Okay, Chuku. Can you hear me, please? All right. So let's go to the other one. Uh, Am he asks, uh, what can we use to build appraisal system in an organization? Hello, hello. Okay, I think our both team is ready to talk now. Hello, go ahead. Um, good evening. Good evening. Yeah, Doc. Good evening. I uh, I think most of my questions have been uh, uh, asked and answered. But there's uh, one particular one I need to bring on board, which is not really a question, is, uh, is uh, an inquiry per se. What is uh, the best HR data tool that is all inclusive one can use now? Mm, okay, um, I use um, Orange HRM, but I know that there are other ones. Maybe in the course, because we're going to have a practical class in this course, especially if you're going to um continue with the certification maybe in the process we can look at the different tools but currently okay. yeah you can currently you can consider orange hrm okay sir okay so let me wait till then yeah thank you all right all right princess please go ahead okay okay uh the question from a day m he's asking what tool we use for Oh, I can't really hear you. Your network is breaking. Princess. Did you have a question, please? I didn't get it. Your network was breaking at the point. Okay, I can't hear Princess anymore. I guess she's having. I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Okay, I can hear you now. Yes, please go ahead. I said, um, Ade M asked the question. He okay. said, What tools can be used to build appraisal systems in an organization? Okay, I just answered someone's question in line with that now. So I guess that has answered it. Okay, then let me ask the next question. The next one by Edidion Uyoko. She said, explain simply the words, skills, duties, responsibilities, and roles in, in human resource management. Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, can you hear me, please? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. The question by Chine Du Anuka. He says, in terms of handling complaints, is it better to have uh, an independent human resource body, especially when an employee wants to report a top management personnel of inappropriate conduct? Okay, um, if I get the question right, he's asking if it is better to use um, consultants, right? But then it depends on, or I, I don't know that he, or, she, or he's also talking about um, um, maybe labor unions and all that. So like I, I, I said earlier, when I was responding to the person that was um, talking about um, 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 a manager that doesn't adhere to the policies. You need to see that one count the cost. Of course, if it is an organization that uses consultants, 
it means that they don't have in-house HRM. So the organizations like that, they have um, consultants that manage their human resource management. But then if you're talking about going to report to employee, um, um, that's the part of employee relations now, labor unions and all that. So you need to be sure that you have counted the cost. What's the implication to the, to the organization? Is it going to affect the business of the organization? If it's going to affect it, is it going to also affect you as an individual? Are you ready to take, take that step without minding how it's going to affect your job and all that? If you have done the analysis, I think um, you can do that. Then you can go ahead. Otherwise, you can still resolve to um, using internal procedures. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then yeah. lastly, we have a question. We have a question in the chat room by Gloria Chizoba, EKD Faber. Her, her hand seems to be up. So maybe I could just um, unmute her so she gets to ask the question herself. Gloria? Yes. Yes, okay. yes, thank you very much. I'm sorry if I'm asking too many, too many questions. Though. Go ahead. Okay, sir. Um, in human resource management, there's a concept of a psychological contract. What does that really mean? All right, um, Mrs. Gloria. Um, yeah. yeah. I guess if, if, you, if you're going to continue with us in this class, um, that's one of the areas we're going to talk about. Please. Like I said, this is an introductory class. So let's just get the basics. Because some of those areas, we're going to take time to, um, to lecture on them. So I'll advise that we wait until we get to. Just give me a hint, please. Give me a hint, I beg. Just give me a, an idea. Okay, you said. All right. Um, sorry, sorry, Mr. Chidi Um, for the sake of time, Mrs. Gloria, we we'll have um, we we'll have a separate class on um contracts, and there is psychological contracts that is going to be handled in the main class for HRM. So, like Mr. Chidi K pleaded, uh, we appreciate if you can um, um exercise patience to that time. You have okay. all your answers given in that area. Thank you so much. It's okay. Bye bye. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right, Princess, over to you. Okay, so we have answered all the questions and I'm, um, I'm pretty sure that everyone has a satisfied, is satisfied right now with the answers they've gotten. So with this, we come to the end of um, today's class and we, appre we appreciate everyone who participated to ask questions, who contributed in one way or the other. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have gotten the link, the attendance link, please use it so that um, you could register your attendance in this class. And then um, the group link has also been sent in the chat room. Please feel free to use it so that you can get into um, a group. If you have further questions, don't hesitate to ask the questions right there in the WhatsApp group. Well, thank you all for coming. We do hope that you would um, be back in the next class that we'll be having. So um, we'll send out information in the WhatsApp group for you so you get to know uh, other classes, the time, and every other information that will be necessary for you. So until then, from all of us here, in IIPMI, we say thank you very much and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Princess. All right, thank you so much, Princess. And thank you so much, Honorable um, GDK, for the wonderful sessions you people have hosted. That have been awesome. Um, we'll be returning by um, 6.30 to complete the lecture for today. And, and afterwards, we can go have a wonderful time. From here, we are saying a very big thank you for joining us in this second lecture. Is there anyone here who has not signed attendance today? If not signed attendance today, please can you um, indicate by typing one one in the chat room? You've not signed attendance at all today. Uh, please can you indicate by typing one one, please? Um, Princess, can you please put the attendance in the, in the chat room so that those who have not signed attendance can do that right now?
All right, so the attendance link has been posted. If you've not done your attendance, please kindly do so. And please, if you have not joined us on YouTube, um, um, kindly um, go to YouTube and type IPM International, kindly subscribe so that you can get all lectures. Um, someone is asking a question from the chat room. He said, um, 6.30 PM, two hours class, what course? Uh, please kindly check the timetable that was um, issued out. You'll find a class um, that will be going on by 6.30 today. All right. Check your timetable and you'll find out. And I'm seeing, is it compulsory we must have CIPM and uh, CIMC to be, to be certified or either of the two as a HR professional? Please, the choice is yours. If you wish to be certified by CIPM, it's your choice. If you wish to be certified by CIMC, it's your choice. If you wish to have the two, it's your choice. No one is of less privilege than the other. Okay, so anyone you choose, if you have the resource to go for two, great. If you have resource to go for one, please um, choose the one that is most of um, important to you. Okay, and I'm seeing what's the WhatsApp group for PMP, please. Um, Princess, can you please post the WhatsApp groups again so that um, we can all have that here? Princess, can you please post the WhatsApp groups so that we can have that um, here? As a matter of fact, this class has ended. So if you have questions other than HRM or any other thing, please, you can ask. That's maybe for those of us that we are not here in the morning, we might take five minutes to address those questions. Um, but let your question be in the chat room. Uh, we'll address them as we go. And uh, I said, please, next class is when. Wait, this Kingsley Udeoji, you're the one that posted C30, and they're asking again, which next class is when? Is it that you? Please ask a question that is direct, please. Your question has already been answered and you posted here is 6.30 p.m. and you're asking again, when is the next class, all right? Please, let's not um, give sweat to the coordinators and people administering the classes. Thank you. All right. Um, if there is any question, please, um, else we can say thank you for coming and then we'll be out of here. He said, um, thank you very much for Paul. Kindly confirm one, kindly confirm if one complete the GHRM certification, will it be required to still write? Okay, please, important to note, um, GHRM is a course that is accredited by um, SHRM. It is not SHRM XCP and it's not SHRM CP. So in case you have interest for SHRM HCP and SHRM or SHRM CP, there are two different certifications. All of them are HR certifications, but two different certifications, right? All right, another person says, please, I was unable to join in the first two sessions in the morning due to my inaccurate timing. How do I go with attendance? Please just sign your attendance for now. Attendance is only once. So if you did not sign attendance in the morning, kindly sign attendance now, or you could sign attendance in the evening. Okay, please, is the attendance the same with the one in the morning? Yes, if you've signed your attendance in the morning, please don't bother signing again. It's just one we need per day. And um, is there any other question? I'll be closing this class by 6, 8, uh, 4 30 on the dot. So if there is any other question, um, we will answer that. If one holds an MBA, HR, and CIPM certification, do I still need to write? The GHRM exam. If you need the GHRM certification, then you need to write the exam. But in this case, you will be writing for the senior level rather than the level one or level two. You'll be writing for the uh, global level, right? All right. That's if you still wish to do that. Wait, Odo David, HSC has already started and this class is part of HSC. This is a general class for everybody. So whether you're doing HSC, PMP or HRM, this is a general class for everybody, all right? So HSC classes has already started. I'm just coming in, please. How do I sign attendance and get further information? You sign attendance by filling in the attendance. Uh, Mr. Kuladako, Ladiko, please. You sign the attendance by filling in the attendance form. Princess, can you please post the attendance form one more time? 
for Kulada Ko, Ladiko. We just have a few seconds left. Okay, so Kulada Ko, Ladiko, please, the, the class, the, the link is already shared. Please kindly fill up. He said, please, what's class for all? Please, what's class? For, okay, so you have the class WhatsApp posted by Oludula Konubi. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Oluduna Kwo. Um, our next class is by 6.30. So please, let's have our rest and come back by 6.30. And that will be the last class for today. See you by 6.30 and do enjoy a wonderful time. Please, I um, would like to categorically say here that if you ask questions that have been answered over and over again, be it in the chat room, be it vocally, we will not respond to you. If you ask a question that has been sent to email, that has been sent to chat room, that has been sent to text message, and you're still repeating it here, we will not answer you. We believe that you don't want to pay attention to information that is being shared, and you just want to stress us, and we will not stress ourselves answering those questions. So thank you so much. I see you by um, by 6.30. From me, it's a goodbye from here. <laughs>